Hi, I'm Kim Payne. I'm the city manager, and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here tonight for this discussion, this, this start of a conversation about uh, an, an opportunity and a challenge that we are facing downtown and that, and that I'm hoping we can all work through together. Uh, I asked the staff to give me a, um, a slide of uh, lemons being made into lemonade. And uh, this, is, this is what we're here to, uh, to work together as we work through this conversation over the ensuing uh, months uh, and, and beyond to address uh, our goal, our collective goal, I believe, to continue to make downtown a great place for people to, uh, to live, to work, to play, to do business, uh, and to enjoy uh, as a part of this uh, broader region. Uh, and this is an inevitable uh, thing that happens in an urban area that we have to deal with here, and so we want to talk about that and, and again to start this conversation. We have been working, um, the Water Resources Department has been working for about five years to try to uh, understand the utility situation uh, downtown, particularly the water uh, line situation. Our oldest infrastructure, our oldest piece of water infrastructure downtown that is still in active use was installed in 1829. 1829. We ought to put a plaque on that fire iron. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's probably not going to last for another hundred and so years. Um, the other than the Knott Street utilities that were done a few years ago as part of the CSO project, and some of you who, who are familiar with downtown for a while remember when that Knott Street improvements were made, and, and we had uh, quite the big dig on uh, at Ninth and Main. Other than those water lines, the next youngest water lines were installed in 1930 in the 1930s downtown. The average age of our water line, our water system downtown is over 100 years old, and it is approaching the end of its life. Um, there's a slide here that I want to show you. Okay, so, again, why, why we're here, we have to replace this aging infrastructure. Uh, we have, certainly, those of you who have been down, moved down here in the last few years know the incredible success we've had over the last 10 to 15 years in, in redeveloping downtown with the support of city council, uh, putting a million dollars a year in infrastructure improvements downtown. I want to recognize Mayor Gillette, who is here. Um, there may be some other council members have indicated that they will uh, be coming in at some point because they wanted to uh, participate in this as well. So we need to accommodate that increasing demand and we want to leave things better than, than they were or are today as part of our continuing work to improve downtown. These, um, these are the, uh, uh, we are seeing an increasing number of water and sewer repairs necessary downtown as development is increasing demand on the infrastructure system downtown. And this just shows you, you can certainly see in the Main Street corridor, some of the businesses along there have had flooded basements. Some of you may have experienced that um, as the water lines um, are, are deteriorating, um, both on Main Street but also on Church and Commerce as well. And so the goal here is to upgrade this infrastructure for the next 100, 150 years uh, as, we, as we do this um, project. I want to talk about, as we do this project, we do have some, some goals that we think we want to hold true to, and this is what we want to, your feedback to make sure we have the right goals, we have an understanding, and then for you as this process goes through, as we develop the, the how this is all going to happen, to please hold us true to these principles and these goals uh, if, if you do support those. Um, we want to, and we are very determined, a successful downtown, a successful urban environment, uh, in a, in a community has is very business friendly and is very pedestrian friendly. And those two go absolutely hand in hand. Businesses uh, in a downtown environment thrive on an active pedestrian environment where the pedestrians are safe and where it, it's efficient for, for the pedestrians to move around in that area and to get to these businesses, um, whether that's a restaurant or retail or any other kind of business that lo locates downtown. So that has got to be our absolute priority here I'm not going to say that we can't, we won't have an impact on that. This process can't have some impact on that, but we've got to work consistently and hard and strong to, to, to reach that goal. We want to ensure that this, what we, have, what we do downtown is sustainable in a number of ways, both environmentally, uh, stormwater issues, uh, tree canopy issues, things like that. We want to make sure it's financially responsible, and we want to make sure that it's something that we can maintain over time in the least disruptive 
the most cost-effective way that it's possible. And because the successful downtowns also have, have successful parking programs, we want to maximize on-street parking, again, to support the businesses downtown and to support that active pedestrian environment. Now, there's a few other less um, high-priority goals here, but they also that we want to try to accommodate as we do this. One of those is we want to create an environment downtown that supports bicycle traffic. Um, again, not as high a priority maybe in some of this, but we want to uh, support a multimodal environment of transit, bicycles, certainly walking, and, and other opportunities. Those of you who, who have been here for the last 10 or so years know the sort of growth that has occurred downtown. Um, 353 businesses have opened, 700 jobs created, I'm not going to read it to you. A lot of residential development is occurring, um, very high occupancy rates. And so, to, to a large degree, we have been successful as a community in redeveloping our downtown and replanning our downtown as uh, a vibrant and a successful place for this community. And our goal, again, is to continue to do that and to, and to continue to, to accelerate that <coughs> as, we, as we move on. This just indicates some of the new building permits that have been issued downtown uh, in the last, uh, since 2003. And you can see it's, it's not necessarily focused in any one area, it is throughout the entire, the entire downtown area. Now, we are going to um, be looking at the waterline replacement on the streets here that are highlighted uh, in the in college. I hope you had a chance to look at some of the, some of the um, the displays over here to my left. Um, but Court Street, Church Street, Main Street, and Commerce Street, and then the connecting, interconnecting side streets. That is the, the broad phase and the broad scope of the waterline replacement project. This shows our latest thinking on the phases. I will tell you this has gone through three or four or five iterations already, trying to understand what the what the what the proper uh, phasing is and, and for each section here, whether it's six blocks or six block sections. We will talk both about blocks and block sections, uh, whether it's eight, whether it's 12, and all of these things are gonna depend on a number of variables such as money, such as how long it would take to construct a section, and things like the impact on the community. So right now, this is divided into about six phases, with the first phase being from 5th to 8th, and then back out to Main Street. Again, don't know where it starts and where it finishes, but that's the, that's the section that we are going to be focusing on uh, in the nearest future. We hope to use this um, section uh, to inform us and to teach us how better to go through all of this as we go through over time. Right now, our best thinking is that each section might take a year to, to 18 months to complete. So you do that math, and we're down here for a long time replacing these lines. Whether or not this can be done any faster is something that we're exploring. We're actually exploring some grant funding from the federal government to see if we could get a big chunk of money to do this faster. That has other impacts as well that we need to discuss as a community. But this is the phasing, and we'd like to talk about, about that. Again, here's the phase one project impacting, we have, we have two very active projects right now that are trying to renovate and trying to open um, in the 2017 time frame, uh, the Virginian Hotel and the Academy of Fine Arts. And the last thing that I personally want to do is have either one of these facilities open with a brand new facility and then we come in a few months later and say, well, now it's time to tear up the streets. Uh, and, uh, and have that kind of impact. So we also need to connect to an existing water line. We have replaced most of the water infrastructure in Fifth Street. The, the water that's coming downtown is fed from College Hill down Fifth Street, and so we'll be connecting to, a, to new infrastructure that is here and then moving into this area of downtown to uh, establish that. Uh, we have utilities folks here from, from Water Resources who can talk to you about um, the intricacies of this, of this system, uh, the fact that we have two pressure zones downtown, which is in essence two separate water systems, and how we're going to go about trying to recombine trying to combine that into one system, and then all the complexity. Let me give you a sense of the existing utilities downtown. Um, you've seen, and those of you who are downtown and paying attention have seen all the painting on the streets. 
Well, we've surveyed, we've tried to survey all of these utilities that are, that are existing downtown, and doesn't this look like what the paint you've seen on the streets? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the complexity. And I'll tell you, despite all of the preliminary work that's done, all the survey work, all the reviewing of plans, the first hole we dig, we're gonna find something we don't expect, because that's just the way it works in, a, in an urban environment. And so we're trying to be very, very sensitive to how we accomplish that. So let me talk a little bit about it. So I think that's, that's the why, um, that's the goals, but I wanna talk a little bit about the how. Our thinking right now is to start phase one, excuse me, this phase one project as early as uh, January of 2016. And we believe we need to start it in January of 2016 in order to be finished mid-year of, of 2017 when this facility is gonna open, when the Virginian is, is slated to open. So that's, that's our goal. Exactly how we're gonna do that, we don't know yet because this has not been fully designed. We don't have a construction schedule. We, we don't understand the time frame and the phasing and exactly what's gonna happen in what order. The, our process, we have an RFP on the street right now, a request for proposals to uh, receive uh, expressions of interest from contractors who will operate under a, what we call a construction management at risk process, where we will, this is not a low bid project. I wanna put that on the table right now. We have a few low bid projects in the city that I'm personally frustrated with, and I'm not sure you are too. Uh, this is not a low bid project. We are gonna work through the procurement process, through the proposal process to find a construction management firm that will, will shoulder some of the risk of completing this project, of helping to both design how this project works and completing it on time. And there will be penalties and repercussions if it's not completed on time. And so we will be working together with them in a partnership before we ever complete the design work. In a normal process, we design it, we put, the, we put it out for bid, we get bidders, we have to take the low bid under state law, and then you, then you deal with what you've got from then on. And so we are, we're gonna have a different approach here that we think is more, has a better chance of being successful, of moving this project forward, of completing it on time, and in the least disruptive manner possible. We also are gonna understand the incredible importance of communicating with you about what is happening downtown. And so we are gonna, we are having another request for proposals on the street to hire an agency that will help us with our communication strategy, our outreach, and all, and to make sure that we have the proper procedures, tactics, personnel in place to communicate openly, transparently, and frequently about this project. We also intend, as part of the planning process for this, to knock on every one of your doors for a personal visit to talk about your issues, your concerns, your fears, and your ideas on how we make this work for this community working together. So this very much needs to be a partnership between the city, between the business owners, between the landlords, between the residents, and ultimately between the contractor uh, downtown who's gonna do this work. We have some concepts. This is the lemonade part of this. We have some concepts. It would be one thing to come in here and say, we just, this is a waterline replacement project, let's tear up the streets, put the water lines in, and say, ta-da, we're done. We collectively don't believe that that's appropriate for this community to just tear up the streets, put the patches back down, and then walk away from an opportunity that we have to improve the streetscape downtown. And so the, some of the ideas that we have about that are over here and on these. Uh, there's about eight, down, eight different ideas, I think, right now, potentially, that could, could happen. Uh, and, and part of our outreach to the business owners and the residents downtown is going to be to understand how their block works, how their building works, and what opportunities we have for these streetscape improvements in the end um, downtown. This is not a cookie cutter. Every block could have a different finish on it in terms of uh, the side, how the sidewalks work, how the landscaping works, how the street furniture works. And so very much, one of the, the joys I personally believe of the downtown is that it's eclectic. That it's not the same thing in every block. That you walk around a corner and there's something potentially different that was in, than in the last block. Uh, and so we want to enforce that and promote that as much as possible. 
as we work with the owners of property in each of these blocks to create a vibrant streetscape, um, again, that is business friendly, that is pedestrian friendly, that maximizes on street parking, and that works to make this downtown a more dynamic environment. So that's, that's this, is, this is our goal. One of the things we think that needs to happen as we do this construction work, as, and we don't quite know, again, how it's gonna work, but some of the things we're gonna be talking about is, should we be shutting down entire blocks to do this construction? Or should we keep the blocks open to some sort of vehicular traffic? There's an absolute hard line commitment that we're gonna keep these blocks open to pedestrian traffic throughout the construction. <coughs> that there will be pedestrian access to all the buildings as this goes on. And that is a hard commitment that we intend to, to follow. What happens with the vehicular traffic is a question that we need to explore with the construction management firm and with the, with the property owners downtown. Because there's a trade-off. We can do the work a lot faster if there's no traffic on the street. So that has an impact. If we, if we keep the street open, it takes a lot longer. So the impact, maybe it's less, but it's longer. So we have to talk about cumulative impact issues and what's best. There are some blocks downtown that there's not a whole lot happening. And maybe we do something different in that block than in, a, than in another block because of the activity that is already going on on the street. I think about, in particular, the Verizon building here, where there's not a lot going on on that side of the street, but there's some really neat things going on on the other side of the street. So how do we handle, how do we handle those trade-offs as we go through this process? That's the discussion that we intend to have. I want to be clear to you tonight that we do not have answers to this yet. We, are, we want to start a conversation. We want to work together to resolve this as we, as we all move forward. Let's see what else Scott was supposed to say. Oh, yeah. The, big, uh, the elephant in the room. We think that one of the ways to accomplish this work in, a, in, a, in the least disruptive fashion is to have two-way traffic on some of these streets, um, particularly during the construction. We may find that we have to actually reverse the flow of traffic on some of these streets to, again, to maintain access to buildings. Uh, you may recall some of you who were here for the 9th Street. Uh, we actually, Main Street was two-way for a while. So in order to accommodate what was going on when 9th Street was, was shut down, we had a huge hole in 9th Street. So we want to be creative uh, in looking at, at exploring ways to address the impacts of this construction and we think that, that two-way traffic is going to be is going to be part of that answer. Uh, we've already converted some of you know Seventh Street and Eighth Street to two-way traffic, and that was to accommodate this construction that's going on right here, so that the construction vehicle doesn't have to go all the way down and around to get back to this building, uh, in or out. Um, those seem to be working okay, but those don't here have nearly the sort of traffic demand of, of these these streets. Those folks in this community who are used to using Main Street um, and Church Street as a way to get from one end of town to the other, from Rivermont to the expressway, without thinking about stopping downtown, merely using it as a bypass, are gonna find that that is gonna be a real challenge as we're doing this work on these streets. My perception, my belief, is that downtown should be a destination, not a place that people drive through at 40 miles an hour. 40 miles an hour is bad for business, it's bad for pedestrians, it's bad for bicyclists, it's bad for parking, it's bad for downtown. Now, where we end up with this, again, as a, someone who has lived this for the last 15 years here in this community and believes strongly in this, I would like to think that in the end, two-way traffic on all these streets is gonna work and will be a better environment for all of us downtown. That's not my decision. It's not a decision that's being made right now. It's something we're gonna learn about as we, as we manage this construction through this process. But our thinking right now is that a poss possible end state is two-way traffic on Main and Church with four-way stops at the intersections. I don't know about you, I'm tired of sitting at 7th Street at that red light when there's nobody coming down the street and I'm waiting to wait for, for somebody, um, I have to wait for the light to change. Four-way stops accommodate bicycle traffic without increasing turn lanes, without adding turn lanes. Because when we put in lights, we have to put in turn lanes. 
So all of this needs to work together, and this is what we need to be talking about as a downtown community as we try to move this forward. So here's our schedule. These, these RFPs are on the street right now. The proposal for construction management services is due uh, on July the 22nd. I'll tell you right now that we are, we are learning that because of summer schedules, that might be a challenge for some of these construction firms, and we may have to address that and move that. But that has not been decided. The request for proposals for public involvement and outreach services are due July the 28th. We hope to finalize a contract um, in mid-September. Construction right now, we plan to begin uh, in January of 2016 with final completion in May of 2017. We are committed to communicating with you. This is just where we're starting right now. We're gonna set up a conversation on Lynchburg Alerts, so you can certainly do that. You can really um, give us comments and questions. Uh, we understand that people communicate in different ways. This meeting is only one way. These are a couple of other ways. We're hoping that our contractor that we hire to help us with this will tell us four or five other ways to, so that people who are interested in this can, can be involved. Some of you, many of you, I hope, are members of Lynch's Landing. That'll be another way to, um, to receive information. They've already been sending information out to their members, I believe, and they're gonna be very involved with this process in helping us, again, to work together as a community to, to accomplish this. I believe I have gotten all the high points. I want to recognize Council Member Turner Perro who's here. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we were trying to figure out what the vacancy rate was downtown just to show that we're not done. We're not done downtown. Um, there's still more growth to come. There's still empty buildings. If you look at the streetscape, the business, the business street, there are too many empty storefronts. We want to overcome that and we want to get some of these buildings. And so we know the demand is going to only um, increase downtown. So this was, an, this was an effort to try to understand our vacancy rate. That seems low to me, but uh, we're gonna continue to try to refine it. What else have I missed? I need my staff that's here. All right, I did recognize Councilman Perro. I don't know if any other- Vice Mayor Johnson. Oh, Vice Mayor Johnson, excuse me. I was looking right over your head. Okay, thank you for coming. So now it's time for us to listen to you. This one. What sort of questions or concerns or advice um, do you have for us? Yes, sir. Uh, it sounds like there's no way to avoid uh, losing some parking spaces on the streets that they've worked on. There, there may be no way to avoid losing some parking while the streets are being worked on, but we believe that we can actually increase on street parking by going to the two-way um, and uh, looking at this, oh, the other elephant in the room. Um, we are absolutely committed to addressing the loading zone issue. That has to be addressed if we go to two-way traffic. We've got to figure out how to load and unload these, these businesses and these buildings. Um, I have been joking with people that I'm going to take a lawn chair up to Charlottesville and sit on the mall, and the pedestrian mall, and see how they do it, because I've had more than one person in this community say, well, we just want to recreate the Charlottesville Mall in town here. Uh, and I'm going, well, wait a minute. They, how does that work? How are they loading and unloading all those restaurants and all those businesses? I'm convinced that can, we can figure out a way to do it, um, but I uh, don't know how that is yet. But your question was about parking, so I kind of want to pay attention. Yeah, so assuming parking spaces, will be, some will be lost at some time. So is there any plans for the city to at least temporarily obtain more parking spaces for people to walk? We, we know that, that addressing the parking Parking that's going to within reasonable walking distance is going to be uh, an issue that we have to deal with. Um, we have we don't know quite how to do that yet. Um, yes, we will lose some on-street parking while we're under construction, but there's you know 75 percent of the parking downtown is like just is, is in private ownership. The city does not control it, and that's including the on-street. So um, we've got you know two city parking decks downtown in the downtown area, and we manage a couple more. So we definitely know we need to address the pedestrian access to convenient parking that's within a reasonable walking distance. So that's an issue we're gonna work on. Um, I'm glad to hear that you are planning to have someone to handle the communication because I think that's gonna be very important for all of us uh, in terms of keeping everyone informed what's going, what's happening and 
Uh, I mean, a good example was 8th Street when it became two-way street. Most people around there didn't even know that. Um, the, the, the comment about you know making traffic uh, going slower, I, I think what we need to do is to actually enforce a, a process where it does slow people uh, uh, driving, it, not just a four-way stop, but but other uh, you know stipulations such as when people are walking through an intersection that cars must stop. I mean, most cities in in Virginia, you have signs that says you know people in in uh, uh, intersection car. The law says. Virginia law says you must stop. I think well, the problem is Virginia law doesn't say you must stop. It says well, you must yield pedestrians, which doesn't mean stop. Well, well, and, well, and many well, drivers understand that. Well, <laughs> then, then let's, let's, let's enforce a, 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 a manner that, that educates everyone to do that, because if we don't do that, people will still speed up. Well, okay, I'll let you finish your thought, and I've got a couple of thoughts in response. And then finally, uh, you know, I, I think what, what we're doing here is obviously a, a, a enhancing our city landscape in terms of the city streetscape. Um, I think it is time also to, to get at the businesses who are on Main Street and other businesses that we have that where the places are empty and, and they're not, uh, and, you know, physically uh, are taking, being taken care of, that we, we have to have some kind of a policy that says, you know, if you have a business, take care of it. You know, show, show, make the facade look appealing. That's how we're going to get new people come downtown. That's how we're going to get new business to come downtown. So let me start with that comment first, and I've got comments on your other two comments. Uh, but um, our economic development office has already been, been supporting facade improvements right. downtown. It takes some investment from the property owner, but the, the economic development office has been very supportive of those sort of things. We, Lynch's Landing has done that in the past as well, and we think that that's, that's something. In the end, the, the owner's got to make that decision personally, himself or herself, to actually do something to enhance their building. But you we can extend it out. You can't leave your building in, in on the mall not taking care of it. Uh, there's a small motel down there that uh, would, well, would, would counter that argument. Yeah. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. But, yeah. So, the, our authority to enforce that, I think, is somewhat, is somewhat limited. But it is something we, we should find a way to incentivize. Um, talking about we had a discussion among the staff, and, and we had some concerns about whether we say we said whether the, it was appropriate or, or a good thing to say we're going to slow traffic down. We want to talk about greater traffic efficiency, and we think that you that, that actually slowing traffic down can be a more efficient way for, for streets to work downtown. Um, it's a more efficient way to to uh, to accommodate pedestrians and bicycles, and we also think that it can actually work better because if it's all flowing. Everybody's following the rules. Uh, if it can flow better and you can, you can some delays, you're not racing from one block to the other as fast as you can go because you know you have a reasonable expectation. You can move through efficiently. And so, yeah, slower is part of it, but greater efficiency. And the, the traffic calming idea, bump, bump outs, trees, and frankly, if there's something happening in a building that's really neat, people are gonna slow down. Um, because that's, that's what the environment is supposed to be downtown. The last point, which was your first point, uh, about communication. I don't want anybody to think for one minute that the fact that we're going to hire someone to help us with communication means we're not taking responsibility for the communication that needs to occur. And so we will have identified city people who are go-to people. Um, we're not going to bring some stranger in from Maryland and say, okay, communicate with this community. It's not. So I want you to understand we are taking ownership of communication. We are seeking some help and how to do that better. But you're going to be talking to, your, to neighbors and friends and people who are invested downtown about this project, not someone who doesn't live here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm sure that there's a, it has to do with how the water systems work and where the pressure valves are and all kinds of complex stuff. But why would we take our two major arteries coming in from Rivermont and going out from Rivermont and do them in the same phase? Okay, you're right, it does have to do. I mean, we, for one thing, the, the way to do this is to, is, to, is to connect to the existing infrastructure, the new infrastructure that's in the street right now. And so there's new infrastructure right here. We left the valve so the connections can be made and there's new infrastructure right here. And this is where the feed comes for all fire protection and all the water, all the domestic water downtown is coming from College Hill. Um, and so we've got, we, it's more efficient, we think it's better to connect 
to the new infrastructure as we move out. The other, the, the other reason for starting here is because this and this, the Virginian and the Academy of Fine Arts. If those projects, this one is going already, it's under construction, if this one is successful and gets under construction again, I don't want to tear the streets up in front of it after it opens. So our goal is to, is to be ahead of these, of these openings. But, I mean, we we're doing them simultaneously, couldn't we do Church Street and then Main Street? Or so we would have more traffic if we're talking about eliminating the... Well, part, part of the discussion that we will have with the construction manage, management team is whether or not, you know, we should maybe do that. I'm not saying all this will be torn up at the same time. There'll be a process, and maybe they'll go down here, and then they'll go down here. Maybe and when they're going down here, we make this two-way. I don't know. Those are those are all. You, that's a really good question, and those are the sort of things that will be discussed. It may be that if we close this, making this two way, and, get, and getting the cross streets working, that we don't have as big an impact as we would have otherwise. So all of that is part of the discussion. Part of what the feedback we want to hear is we go and knock on doors of individual businesses. But that's a, that's a great point. So I don't. I mean, if I gave the impression this will all be totally torn up at the same time, I don't. I don't believe that would be the case. My utilities guys can tell me if I'm wrong. Scott Parkins is back here. Uh, Scott has been the uh, project manager from the Water Resources Department. Raise your hand again so they can see you. I want you to know who these folks are. Um, he is uh, our point person on the design and, and uh, those sort of questions. That, that's a great question. Tim Mitchell, the director of Water Resources, is here as well. What else? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question about uh, parking accommodations um, during business hours for people who park in the uh, private lots during construction when they are um, blocked off or whatever, the access is blocked off. What kind of accommodations are we going to receive? Oh, I don't know the answer. The question was what sort of accommodations would be made for, for the people who park in, in the private lots or, or the surface lots or the decks. Um, as this construction is going on, because there may be difficulty in getting getting to it, but I think part of our goal will be to to remain to maintain as much access as possible to those. And if and if there's if we if we deny access, to understand how long it's going to be, and then to make some accommodations somewhere else to to, to deal with that. It's again, we don't control 75% of the parking downtown, so we're going to have to work with the private property owners and the private parking lot owners and private deck owners to work to work through that. But it is an issue that we, we we have to address. Any other issues that we've missed? Can we? Yes. What, uh, just to make sure I understand on the uh, the two way um, on Main Street and Church Street is so this is going to be a learning process through maybe phase one, maybe phase two to see how that works. Not going in and taking the stoplights out and making that irreversible. Not, no. No, not this. This design, by the way, I just want to. Um, this design will accommodate this this idea on how the streetscape gets done and how the how the new parking maybe goes in. This this can accommodate one way or two way traffic. So we are not saying we are set in stone. I'm convinced that we will learn the two way traffic is a good thing and we'll learn how to accommodate it. That's my hope. But if it doesn't work, we can these can easily be one way streets. And will there be a comprehensive study of what that would look like and how it would work before, I mean, is that sort of anticipated as part of this? You know, we had a comprehensive study done about eight years and they said it would work and, and half the people believed it and half the people didn't believe it. Uh, so, uh, you know, another comprehensive study that half the people believe and half the people don't, I think we're going to demonstrate it. Um, there are still people who remember when we went two-way on Main, when, uh, the Nice Street construction, I hope one of them was on the front row, who says, what a great thing. Why, why haven't you done it? You know, get going. Um, so we will learn, and and but again, our our primary purpose for the two way in the interim is to accommodate this construction and to keep this businesses working downtown. And if we have to go two way on Main to do that for a while, we'll see how it goes, and we'll learn from it, and we'll talk to each other about that as a community. Where is my missing person? Called me out, so called me out. Called wrong you know, the thing is with this uh, two-way street that has to be a little bit uh, explained too, because um, you have a cul-de-sac on the end of the construction where the big hole is, you know, so that uh, the two-way is actually not going all the way 
uh, through the street, is it? It's not going, uh, if you do the first phase here, let's say the yes. Main Street, okay. and uh, um, so you open up parts of it, you know, then the, I, my hope is that you can keep one way open. You know, keep back and vehicular access to the street. Keep one way for the cars open because okay. you almost need that. Convenient parking means that you can take your car practically in front of where you want. Yeah. Um, the, the, the standard rule of thumb is that people are willing to walk about four to 600 feet, which is a block, block and a half, maybe two blocks, if there's really something to see in the windows of the buildings. Because if it's interesting, people will walk further. Um, think about how far you walk when you go and park at the mall. You're walking about a block or two, city blocks or two, uh, in some cases, and that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, but no, you're, there's people who want to park right in front of their business and stay there all day, um, even as they're. I mean, but you're saying that it takes uh, more money and it takes longer if you keep one. Uh, well, it, it may not take more money, but it may take longer. Yeah. But you know that for us, for, for me, for the business, you know, I live through. We have been 17 years open, and we have seen uh, 9th Street choking off practical business. So what I'm very concerned about is I don't want to be choked off again. Even if it does not concern, you don't treat the street open in front of my business, but further down, and it will choke off. Uh, right. And we, again. Yeah, we understand that, that activity in this block could affect business in this block. So it's, it's not just what's happening in front of your business. Um, which does remind me of another point. One of the things that's going to happen here as we, as we do this waterline replacement is we have to fix all the connections to all your build, buildings and businesses. So we, will, we need to talk to you about how when we give you the new water connection, um, how that gets managed because I might have to turn your water off for a little while. It's probably best if I do it around 1 a.m., right, rather than about 8 p.m. So we have to have that conversation. <laughs> yeah, but that is something very important that, uh, Towards the end of that 9th Street CSO project, we really, and you were a big part of that, I have to say that too, you know. Um, there were communication where you could say, okay, look, I mean, you can't do this. You can't put the big uh, uh, asphalt machine in front of my people who are eating dinner, and then they can't get their cars out. So that worked out in the end in favor of that. Yeah. And remember, um, we do have some control over who the contractors are going to be here, so that that partnership and that communication and that raising contractor sensitivity, which can be a challenge, is something that we're going to have to have to accomplish so that they are aware that we have an active business community down here that needs to be protected to the extent that we can. And you know, for the for all of the business owners, there should be a fund uh, in the end. Maybe you can put into the contracts that there is a, a fine, uh, you know, if they're late, week, two, three weeks. Well, we will have to look at the damages in the contract. And the, uh, the business community can uh, participate in that uh, fund. That's, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, when this is taking place, how long is not with communication with us, but communication with people coming downtown. You know, you come down downtown one weekend and you go one way and another weekend another way and eventually it gets to the point where you may not want to come. So are there plans or something we can do to increase the community awareness that you can move downtown and how that's all going to work so that people yeah. don't shy away from it? Well, that's part of what we're hoping that these creative people we're going to hire are help, going to help us figure that out. But but we have already talked about how we do that, whether that's advertising, whether it's signage, um, and which we've done in the past on other projects. Um, I don't know if you were here for the Nat Street Prize, but we made a big to-do about coming downtown and looking at the big hole. You know, come down and see what's going on, because it's going to be different every week, and you can explore what's going on. Um, maybe we have that theme that don't be afraid of this. Come and, and see how it's going. And, um, every time we dig a hole in the street, it's like an archaeological dig, because who knows what we're going to find. There's still wooden pipe in these streets. There's trolley tracks. There's Belgian block. There's, the history of our city is under these streets. And if we can play on that and get people excited and, and get everybody, you know, again, making lemonade out of lemons here, that's what we want to do. And that's, that I'm hoping we can find creative people who are already in this room, um, who live here, to help us to find a way to celebrate this and to make it work so that people don't are not afraid of coming downtown. 
I think we've, we've over the 10 years, 15 years, we've stopped the rumor that, oh, I don't go downtown because nothing's going on downtown. We're fixing that. I don't go down, downtown because it's dangerous. We've, we've addressed that. Um, you know, there's nothing to do. There's no good place to eat. Those issues, all the reasons people stop coming downtown, we're overcoming one by one. We need to overcome that one as well. The great thing is it will stop at some point. And then we won't be back for 100 years. So tell your grandchildren it's going to be great. <laughs> yes, you and then what? You guys have a couple of things to do with local businesses that are going to be choked off a little bit by the construction. I don't know if you said it before. No, I didn't say it because I was avoiding it. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, the question. The question was, are we going to do any compensating of, of businesses? Um, that, is, that is an extremely difficult, I'm not going to give you a good a yes or no answer, okay? That's an extremely difficult thing to contemplate because I don't know how you do it. Um, we, what we are interested in trying to learn is whether there's other communities who have found a way to address this um, uh, in, in a fashion that seems to work. We have had some preliminary ideas about um, whether there is some sort of relief that could be provided. I don't know the answer to that yet because we, we're, in, we're in a Dillon rule state. We can only do what the state says we can do. And we may not have authority to do some of the things we might think are a good idea to do. Um, but we, we do want to explore those, those issues uh, and see how we might go about that. But I cannot give you a yes or no answer. And the second part of that question is, it's almost the same question, but <clears throat> If you do choose to compensate some businesses, some of the more bigger, higher end businesses, are you going to leave out the smaller businesses? <laughs> the question is, if we if we choose to compensate businesses, we only compensate the big businesses and not the small businesses. My my inclination would be to do it exactly the other way around. But I mean, I don't need some business to come and tell me I had a million dollar loss last year to compensate me, and another business saying I had a ten thousand dollar loss, which is even more damaging to that small business than in the million dollar loss to the large business, and I'm just making this up, of course. Um, so big but, business can afford the lawyers. Yeah, big business can afford the lawyers, yeah. But uh, whatever we do, we, we're gonna wanna do it equitably, and if I had any inclination, it would be to help the small businesses, but. There was, yes, Roger. As you work on the streets in front of our buildings, we can't expect new sidewalks. This is, this is the new side, yeah, new sidewalks, new new streetscape, new, I mean, uh, sidewalks, street trees, uh, if it's appropriate for that building. There may be some buildings that say, I don't need a tree here, I want to put topiary and planters. And, you know, if, if you want to do more than we are, are equipped to do, we're having that conversation with the developers of Virginia right now. We, we've talked about a basic plan for them, and if they want to enhance that, we want to accommodate that. We want to accommodate what's going on in the building and respect the building and the block. I think it's really good to have some consistency on the sidewalks rather than different types of sidewalks all of them. That's, that's, that's a discussion that we can have about how consistent, whose comment was that we, there should be consistency on the sidewalks. And I understand that, but um, there are some, we, we have different depths on some of these sidewalks right now. There are some buildings uh, that possibly we can have outside dining because we have a deeper sidewalk. We can promote outside activities on the sidewalks if we have a deeper sidewalk. And in other buildings, and I'm gonna go back to my example of the Verizon building, I don't know that I need really deep sidewalks there because there's not, nothing, ha that building does not connect to the street in any way. That building is there and it's serving a great purpose, but it has no connection. There's no activity between the building and the street other than going to the work and coming out. Um, and so how the buildings work with the street uh, and, and the pedestrians is something we're going to explore block by block and building by building. And it, it could have the same sort of finish. What well, finishes we don't know about yet, um, but it may feel different on, in terms of depth, in terms of street tree plantings, in terms of um, benches or um, trash cans or whatever we want to put in. The consistency of the sidewalk itself. Yeah. Um, you, you just don't want it to be broken up like the buildings are. I mean, uh, having different designs on the side. Well, I love the different designs on all the buildings. We so have I'm, some of that downtown now. We do. And we have some buildings that have brick in front of them. We have some that have flagstone. We have some that have stamped concrete. We have some that have broken up concrete. Uh, we have some that you know, uh, they're, they're, they're in bad shape. And so the goal for here is to, is to have the streetscape 
And this is very similar to those of you who have suffered through CSO projects in your neighborhoods over the year, where we don't just go in and do the CSO work. We, we put new curb and gutter in and new sidewalks and trees. We leave a better neighborhood, and it's the same theory down here, that we leave a better neighborhood when we're done. I personally don't believe it needs to be the same in every street and every block, but it's a discussion we need to have. Yes, Jim. Kim, since you answered the question about sidewalks, do you think there's going to be, and it may be too early to ask this question, but street lighting involved as well? I think there will definitely be street light upgrades involved. Um, you know, uh, and we'll be looking at both consistency, possibly there, and then, and then what happens in the, in the blocks in terms of what sort of lighting do we need. This is, I'm going to put you on this, this is Jim Hines, he's with AEP. I want you to know that we are not blind to the fact that we're not the only ones with, with utilities in these streets. We have AEP uh, involved, AEP is already working right now. Uh, all of this growth has had an impact on the AEP infrastructure downtown. They're already working to try to upgrade this infrastructure to make it better uh, for the long run. Uh, we have reached out to Columbia Gas. I'm not sure if anybody from Columbia Gas is in the room, um, but we will work with Columbia Gas. We will work with the telephone companies. We, we know there's a lot more stuff than just our stuff in the street. That was that, what that picture showed. Um, and we need to work with all of those folks and try to enhance their uh, utilities structure as well. I recognize Jim Foster, another council member who's, uh, who's now with us too, so thank you. Yeah. She was at another meeting that I walked out of, so. Yes. Um, the funding. Do you have funding in place to where it's going to go from from one stage to the next flawlessly, or is it going to be like we do this section and then we have to wait a couple of years for funding to do the next section, or how is that? Has that been planned out yet? As I've been talking, that thought crossed my mind several times. I needed to address that issue, and it keeps going right out. Um, so thank you for for bringing that up. There are going to be there there are two major sources of funding for this project. Um, there is a separate source of funding for the utility project through the Water Resources Department, and I believe that they are getting their funding in place that they can proceed sequentially with phase, 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 phase after phase. The streetscape work is funded through the general fund, uh, which is where we do a lot of other capital projects like Heritage High School. Um, it is our intention to keep up with the utilities. In the, in the funding, that is an issue we have to we have to address. That we that, that is potentially challenging. But we've it's about what did we say? A million dollars a block, half a million in the in the ground, half a million up above the ground to do each of these block. When I say block, it's like from there to there. Is that right? So one million, two million, three million. You can add it up. Okay. And I got the general fund's got half of that to deal with and. The utility fund has the other half to deal with, so we hope to keep up. Yes? Uh, can, could you, um, two questions. One, could you explain what happened with Glenn Trent's property? One. And two, could you give me a rating of how you, uh, how would you rate yourself on past projects? Um, thank you. All right, well. I will tell you that um, everybody's all lawyered up on the Midtown Connector. Uh, the contractor's lawyered up, the trends are lawyered up, we're lawyered up, and so I'm limited to what I can say about that. Um, the distinction with the, with the trend property was there was, a, there was an actual taking of property. It was a, there was an eminent domain action there where the city needed land owned by the trend to, by the trends to do that project. Um, that's a different thing than, than this. We're not taking anybody's property here. This is all in the public right-of-way, all public property. So that's the, the main distinction right now. Um, in terms of rating ourselves, um, I'm not, I, I can't get into a blame game about who's responsible for, for the Midtown project not, not proceeding on the schedule that was, was originally laid out. Um, there's probably plenty of blame to go around. That's why we're all lawyered up. Um, so uh, I would ask that we not be judged uh, on the Midtown project. Uh, it has unique challenges. And uh, um, our intention is to, even if you do grade us D minus, could I even maybe get that D minus out of it? 
um, all of us together. Um, even if you do grade us poorly on that, we hope to learn and we hope to put the, put the things in place so that it will not happen here. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for an A, but a B plus is gonna be cool for me. Um, and that's why construction manager at risk, putting the risk on the construction contractor right up front, but also partnering with that construction, that contractor to do this together and to make the decisions together and to make sure that we've designed this right so that it's constructible and it's quick and we have as few unknowns as possible to deal with. So that is a fundamental change, difference between the Midtown Connector project um, and the Riverfront project, probably a D there too, um, and this project is going to be very different. That is our commitment. Sir, so in this in this uh, contract is going to be uh, an end, a definite end with heavy penalties. We will we will we will sit down as part of, a con of the contract with the with the construction management firm, and there will be an end date that we agree to on that we agree on together. So it's not just saying here it is, but we will we will agree to it, and there'll, be, there'll be penalties if they don't meet it. Now they find you know an artesian well here or something that we don't expect. We'll have to work through that. I'm not going to penalize somebody for what no, nobody knew, but but if, if it can be demonstrated that a lack of performance resulted in a delay, there will be penalties. And we have penalties on these other jobs too. We have liquidated damages. And I mean, we, we did the CSO project too on 9th Street, so you do know what's underneath. We, we know what was underneath 9th Street. I'm not so sure we know what's you know we know generally what's there. And we know what we're going to find, but. Um, sometimes you think the water line is over the sewer line, but the sewer line ends up over the water line, or the gas line goes through the sewer line, or the Verizon line is wrapped around the water line. I mean, these guys can tell you that they never know what they're going to find when they dig a hole. Um, I will tell you that the other thing we'll talk about with the contractor is bonuses. So not only are you penalized if you finish after the schedule, but, but you'll be rewarded if you finish before the schedule. So that's another way to incentivize that, that progress. Yes. Is your goal to have these other projects finished up before you start, you know, doing these new projects, like the riverfront? You know? uh, our our goal was to have the riverfront project finished already, and uh, the Midtown Connector project was supposed to be finished in November. Right now, the contractors are telling us that. Um, I'm not, I can't be held to this because these, they, we have not met a schedule that we thought we were going to meet yet, um, particularly on the Midtown, but um, contractor on the riverfront saying he'll be done at the end of the year. We're thinking that might be more like spring. Um, and we're hoping that Midtown Connector Roads will be open to traffic at the end of the year um, with the final asphalt going down next spring. Uh, again, that is our hope and that is, that's what we're working towards, um, but it is already a year late. Are we going to see, well, two questions. Number one, will they be bearing electrical lines as part of this process as they, I believe, did on Fifth Street? Well, they really did on Fifth Street. Okay. Um, in Fifth Street, we consolidated all the, in Fifth Street, we consolidated all the power lines and the, and the utility lines on one side of the street. Okay. Um, the, the, we could argue all day whether that's attractive or not. Um, most. And Jim can address this, but many of the utility lines are already under, underground, but there are some that are above ground. But the cost of burying them underground, say on Commerce Street or on the above ground court, church. church, on church, um, you're talking adding two to three hundred thousand dollars or more a block to the cost. And I'm just not sure that it's, that it's worth it. And then the second question are you foreseeing gaps between phases and taking six months? in between or are we looking to roll this fairly quickly? I mean, at a year to 18 months per phase and six phases, yeah, is like this a 15 year project? Well, again, one of the things we're pursuing is federal funding. If we got a confusion of you know $20 million in federal funds, we might say, let's do three phases at once. We have to have a conversation about that because that's shutting down three times the streets, potentially in you know some sequence. Uh, we need to talk about that. We would like, to, we would like to be done as quickly as possible and then get on with life. Um, but we need to understand. We're going to have to have that conversation as we look at the funding um, and as we look at what happens as we do this. So we're going to definitely learn as we go through this process. Weather too. 
weather. I mean, yeah, we get we get one of those nasty, you know, snows that then we get to park two week freeze afterwards. That's going to have an impact. Fortunate thing about <coughs> utility line construction is that the ground's not totally frozen. We can put utility lines in the ground. We can't lay brick though. We can't lay concrete. We can't do a lot of things with with bad weather. <laughs> What else? I just want to thank you so much for, for coming. This is yes. One, I'm sorry. Just one last quick question. Just to clarify something you said earlier. Uh, is there the option for the, the city to actually uh, uh, work with private uh, parking facilities to uh, obtain more spaces to replace those on-street parking that will be lost? From we yes, there is certainly an option to work with the private the private lot owners um, and, and the private deck owners to, to work to uh, deal with the fact that we will be losing um, parking in some of these blocks. Uh, Dave Malowitz, where's Dave? How many parking spots do we have in a typical block downtown, both sides of the street? Yeah, it varies. We've got over between the five main streets, not counting the north-south streets, we've got just over about 800 spaces on the street. But in a given, in a given block, you're talking about 20? Maybe 20 spaces, yeah. maybe five to 10 on each side, depending on what's going on. Yeah, depending on what's going on. So, you know, when you close a block, you might lose 10 to 20 spaces, but and how, that's not a huge thing to accommodate potentially, but we gotta, we, we've got to work through that. We, uh, Dave is already managing, uh, Dave Mao is our parking manager. If you don't already know him, he's over here. Uh, he's already managing a couple of private lots. We can, we are certainly open to, to doing that. Um, I would say there is money to be made by private lot owners if they manage their lots better, uh, if they understood how to do that, um, and, 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 and they understood they could offer people convenience and, and a good place to park if they, if they could manage their lots properly. Some of them are starting to do that, others are more resistant to doing that. Again, thank you so much for being here. We're going to stick around for a while. There's some food, there's some drink, there, there's some there's city staff. Um, <coughs> Council members, anything you have to say to us, we, we want we want to hear from you. We want to learn with you as we go through this process. So again, thank you so much for being here.